Hi, my name is Ben Jones. I'm a PhD candidate at Michigan State University, and today I'm going to talk about persistent Laplacians, what they are, why you should care about them, and how you can compute them. So first, I want to place this in context. If you have a typical TDA pipeline, usually you take data, turn it into a filtered complex, compute a topological summary, and then do some sort of interpretation and prediction, often with machine learning methods. Where the persistent Laplacian usually fits in is in the concept of topological summaries. So you compute these persistent Laplacian matrices um, for a filtration pair A, B at some dimension N, and we turn it into, or we compute its eigenvalues. They are real valued and non-negative, so we can order them. And it turns out that the first, or the non-zero eigenvalue, the zero eigenvalues have multiplicity corresponding to the persistent Betty number. Um, so that makes it a really useful way to capture both persistent homology and some additional information through the non-zero eigenvalues. And the key property aligning with that is that the kernel of this operator, the persistent Laplacian, is isomorphic to persistent homology with real coefficients. And this has been used in a variety of applications. So one of those is topological spectral clustering. Another has been to use it in, to predict molecular properties. And it's also been used for single cell differential gene expression. So it's been applied to a variety of real world data um, and has had some interesting results. And it comes from something called the graph Laplacian. Um, so the graph Laplacian is a concept from the 1800s where you take a graph, you form its degree matrix, which for each vertex, you just record how many edges are connected to it. And you put that in the corresponding diagonal. And then there's an adjacency matrix, which just records a one if there is an edge between the two vertices. And then we form the graph Laplacian as the difference between these two. And it has some nice properties. Mainly, we look at its eigenvalues. And in this case, we look at the least non-zero eigenvalue. This is called the algebraic connectivity, or the Fiedler value. Um, and it has useful information that I'll talk about in a second. But the other useful thing is that multiplicity of zero as an eigenvalue tells you the number of components. And that doesn't matter as much for, um, for a graph, because usually you're looking at one component. But for higher order things, it's going to tell you about the homology. So if we take this same example and we analyze in more detail this least non-zero eigenvalue, we can get an eigenvector for it. And if we look at the signs of this eigenvector, so if it's greater than or equal to zero, we put it in this graph on the left. And if it's a negative sign, we put it in the graph on the right. This partitions our graph. And in particular, it is called the min cut partition because we have removed the minimum number of edges to form a disconnected graph. And this eigenvalue itself tells us some lower bound on the connectivity of the graph, which is the number of edges we had to remove. Um, so this is a really useful and interesting thing. And as we do with all things in TDA, we often start with graphs, we produce something in simplicial complexes, and then we produce a filtered simplicial complex version. And that is indeed what we do. So we take the graph Laplacian, we form the combinatorial Laplacian, which is just for simplicial complexes, and then we filter it to get a persistent Laplacian. And as we saw with the graph Laplacian, it takes a form L equals D minus A, but we can also write it in the form of an incidence matrix, which is actually just another name for the boundary matrix of the one skeleton. And we can multi compute that Laplacian as the product of that matrix and its transpose. And when we go to higher order versions, we again get boundary matrices times their, in this case, adjoint is going to be equivalent to transpose. Um, and we do that at our current dimension, the boundary map coming out of that. And then we also have boundary maps that are going into it that we use. And then finally, we upgrade it to the persistent case where we have these new maps D, N plus 1, A, B, um, which interact with the filtration. It's a little odd that the D, N, A maps don't appear to interact with the filtration, but they can be formulated in such a way. But we don't need to do that computationally. Um, so with the graph Laplacian, the dimension of the kernel counts the number of connected components. The kernel of the combinatorial Laplacian for simplicial complexes gives you the homology. And the persistent Laplacian gives you the persistent homology. Um, so it's a really useful generalization. 
But now let's get down to a real example with it. Let's compute a combinatorial Laplacian and then we'll do a persistent one. So let's suppose we have this simplicial complex, four vertices, five edges, and two two simplices. We can compute its boundary matrix from dimension one. So going from edges to vertices and the boundary matrix going from the two simplices to the edges. And we can compute the first Laplacian by doing the matrices times their transposes in the correct order and adding them together. And this gives us some matrix that is a square matrix in um, the first dimension. So L1 corresponds to edges. Each row and column is going to correspond to edges. Um, and this has eigenvalues too. Um, and in particular, there are no zero eigenvalues. So we can see that this has no homology. And the non-zero eigenvalues, there are some results on classifying uh, geometric information about the complex. Next, we can upgrade it to a persistent case. So we're going to take two uh, simplicial complexes. Filtration level B is the one that we just saw, and filtration level A is missing a few simplices. In particular, it has homology uh, at filtration level A, but not at filtration B, so the persistent homology here is trivial because that cycle does not persist into filtration level B. To compute the persistent Laplace in this boundary map dn plus 1 ab is actually really tricky, and uh, Bakundo Mamoli, Jen Chao Wan, and Yusu Wang developed an algorithm for computing it a little indirectly without having to compute the boundary matrix itself, we can compute the up Laplacian. Um, so what I've done is produce a software library that is forthcoming on how to do this in Python relatively simply. Um, so let's look at it with code snippets in this case. So these are the same boundary matrices that we had with uh, the combinatorial Laplacian, uh, but we've added filtration values. So everything is uh, at filtration level zero, except for the two simplices and the last edge that gets added, and those get added at filtration level one. And you can do this with any NumPy boundary matrices that you want. Um, and then it's really straightforward to just assemble this into a persistent Laplacian. So you package the boundaries and filtrations into a persistent Laplacian object, and then you can get the up Laplacian, the down Laplacian, the Laplacian itself, and the eigenvalues. And it only takes a couple lines of code. And you're not just, you don't just have to give boundary maps. You can give a simplex tree from Goody, a rips complex, settler sheaves with real stocks, um, and directed flag complexes. Um, so it's pretty versatile in what types of data it can handle and the algorithms it can use. And if you just assemble it, you can do very simple things like get the Laplacian and it will just give you the Laplacian matrix, or you can skip that entirely and just go straight to the eigenvalues. And in particular with this case, we can say something from the eigenvalues. We knew before that at filtration level A, there was homology, and then at filtration B, it disappeared. And that says that the persistent homology was zero, but our eigenvalues also tell us that because there is no zero eigenvalue. Instead, the non-zero eigenvalues can be used for other applications like the topological spectral clustering or predicting viral properties. If you're interested to learn more about this, pause the video and check out some of these useful references. I hope you really enjoy persistent Laplacians and find them quite useful.